I, I guess I would ask for a differentiation because normally I refer to this as the mother issue. No doubt there are lots of men who are wounded by their mother, just as there are lots of women who are wounded by their father. Some of those wounds are conscious and some unconscious. But the mother issue label reflects a much, much larger thing that we're dealing with because we're not just dealing with the real life mother, although there's some very powerful things that need to occur around that, which are not occurring in the modern world, notably the separation at puberty that traditional cultures would have all insisted upon and would have facilitated with various ritual practices. We've not done that in the last four or 500 years, and I think that's creating huge amounts of problems in the psyche of males, as well as in our society in general. So when I talk about the mother issue, I'm not only talking about the real, live, actual physical mother, I'm talking about the archetype of the mother. I'm talking about the separation of the mother that needs to take place, a movement out of the world of boyhood into the world of, of true mature masculinity. Um, and I'm also talking about things like the inner feminine, which is heavily colored by the mother's experience. And then I'm talking about the transference of that onto other real live women, often to disastrous effects. So it's a much bigger package than just you know me and my actual literal mother. So I hope that kind of clears that up a little bit. This can even involve things like trauma of birth. And by the way, I should interject here, none of my work is ever about parent blaming. This is not about blaming mothers or claiming mothers are responsible for all the dysfunction we see in masculinity. If, if anything, if any blame were be to, to be attached, it probably should go more toward the failure of men to help young men move into this masculine mature expression. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not about, I find it very dissatisfactory to try to blame parents. Most parents do about the best they can. Most of them didn't get the blessing. They didn't get the initiations. Yeah, They're kind of limping along like everybody else. There are some, you know, occasional cases where you have extreme dysfunctions and psychopathologies, but it's really not about mother blaming. So I hope nobody misunderstands me on that particular thing. Right. But Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. We're all affected by birth. Birth is one of the most traumatic things we ever come through. And there's been a tremendous amount of work in the last, particularly the last 40 years, about understanding the imprint that birth gives us and even forms the lens through which we can be affected the rest of our life because of that's the lens we look at the world through. So I've done a lot of work around that particular aspect, particularly with the non-ordinary states of consciousness work that I do. But it's also all the different stages of childhood that we're supposed to be doing developmental processes and whether those get completed or not, or whether they get damaged. Again, sometimes there is failure to separate from mother. In fact, quite frequently, I would argue, in the modern world, we're not really separating from mother. And thus, we have a situation where there are a lot of men walking around in mature, six-foot-tall, 220-pound bodies, but they're still operating on the same psyche of a 12-year-old because they have not been helped through the developmental stages and processes that are needed for someone to come into a real mature expression of masculinity. Yeah. Yes. I witnessed this. And how, how would a man know if he, if that is an active area he needs to look at and maybe what, what would come from healing it? Well, I think what happens for a lot of men is they begin to wake up to this about midlife. And you know, we start off when we're in our twenties, we're kind of bulletproof. Society has told us all the things that we should do to be successful. Uh, we may buy into that more or less. And sometimes we have quite great success in the outer world only to discover at midlife that something's wrong. There's some kind of go into flat land, if you will, where the things that worked maybe when we were in our 20s no longer work. Often there's a deepening sense of, is this all there is? You know, maybe I've attained success or the opposite, I haven't attained success at all. And at midlife, I start really seriously questioning everything, including my relationships, my vocation, who I am as a person. And that's actually the beginning of what can be a very powerful initiatory time period. And I'm using the word initiation in a broad sense to mean processes that truly can become effective enough that when you finish those processes, you wind up with a changed sense of self. So very often it's midlife or there's some crisis that happens prior to midlife. I'm, I certainly work with clients who are younger than midlife, but sometimes people will suffer a great loss. They lose a career, they get a disease, they lose a loved one, they lose a relationship. You know, it's just usually some loss that throws them into this serious questioning of who they are, where they're going, what direction they're headed. And many of them find, I don't have the answers. 
and there's not very many places in our culture to look around because it's not a topic of popular conversation. We do all of our educational processes, for example, are mostly geared toward learning skills that will help you get a job. We almost do nothing to teach people how to do relationships. We don't teach about boundaries. We don't teach about conflict. We don't teach about being self-assertive, being authentic, being in integrity. We don't teach any of that. We just assume people are going to automatically get that when they turn 18. And of course, that's absolutely not the case. So usually it's life sort of catches up with you and people are often thrown into this flatland place where they feel like there's something they need to be doing, but they're not quite sure what. And often it's, again, turning inward. Not that they need to abandon the outer world by any means, but it's a beginning to take into consideration the background of one's life or what typically in depth psychology is referred to as the, the unconscious. And this would involve, this would probably, we'll talk some more about a shadow work, but it involves looking at what are the things that are affecting me, profoundly affecting me, that I have to this point, had no awareness of them. So it's a deep investigation of all the forces and things like complexes and belief systems and the programs that we took on from both our family of origin as well as culture in general, and a serious examination of how those affecting me. So a lot of the work that I do, particularly with men, although I work with women as well, uh, in the same way, is trying to connect with deeper issues in the psyche that the person has been unconscious of, as well as connecting to deeper resources. So it's not just archaeological dig, if to use that metaphor, although that's important as well, but it's equally about a construction project. How do you build this second half of life particularly? How do you do the inner work that allows you to connect with the resources which make you much more effective, both in your relationships, in the outer world, in dealing with boundaries, and ultimately reaching that place where you can become a very positive force in the world in terms of helping other people. Yeah. And it's so beautiful that you are, you know, you are one of those people and we get to have you here on the show who are giving men a roadmap and women a roadmap to get through this, because it is a process that we have very few resources for. And we really have, like you said, we have really no initiation processes, especially for men in our culture. Women, we have a period, you know, we have this menstruation that starts and that kind of helps kick us off into that realm, so to speak. But I do, I mean, obviously we started a workshop on this because we felt like that was a place that was really lacking for the men in our lives growing up. And so we're glad to know you, James. And something you brought up that really aligns with something I was actually watching yesterday. I was watching a woman walk a man through getting into some trauma work and the trauma work that you know, you're know you talking about or, or shadow work, let's call it here, and digging up these places in our unconscious that are wanting to be looked at can go as deep as what you were talking about earlier, which is this birth trauma. I mean, as deep as in utero trauma, where that transitions happens and we are now born into this followed right after by circumcision. Yeah. And we're born into this very uncomfortable situation. And then later in life, like you're saying, maybe midlife or, or maybe even sooner for some, but We have essentially a rebirth again, and there's some sort of almost traumatization that can occur again if we don't have someone to help guide us through it. And so one of the factors that you had listed there or Jaded listed was how men can learn their symbols as a way to begin walking through this work. So James, if you could, you know, Jade and I are both somewhat familiar with symbolism and dream interpretation. I've been dream journaling for over a year now, like really consistently. And we've read some of Jung's work specifically on symbols and dreams, but I would love to get into the basics here with us and our listeners and get into how an authority on this, in this realm, like you can help men look at that stuff or where do they begin looking at their symbols or digging up what the, that even means in the first place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Again, I would argue for a little more differentiation. Usually what I refer to this as learning to think symbolically you might just as well substitute learning to think in metaphor. In other words, to be able to see one thing in another. Part of the problem in the modern world is that we're quite disconnected from symbolic thinking in that we've gone down the road of sort of uber rationality, beginning with first the Protestant revolution, Protestant reformation rather, then the scientific revolution, then moving into the age of enlightenment, and then now the scientific and industrial revolution, where we're quite distant from even the idea of symbolism. So we've moved into a quite epistemological criticism of symbolism. That's partly because science, which has risen to like the ultimate place, and it's replaced religion actually in our culture as the ultimate authority, 
but in science, you cannot deal with symbolism. Things can only mean one thing in science. So for example, to take something as simple as water, and the scientific notation for water is H2O, and it means one thing, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, that's it. It doesn't mean anything else. It cannot mean anything else. Compare that to a bowl of water sitting on your counter. That bowl of water also means H2O, but it might remind you of a fish bowl you had when you were a child and your first pet you lost, which was the goldfish. It might remind you, if you can think even more symbolically, to something as far as as big as the ocean, which is kind of a perfect metaphor for the unconscious. Most of us think of the unconscious at best, if we think of it at all, we generally think of the unconscious as like a giant file cabinet, everything stored in there in manila folders. We don't think of it as it really is, which is living contents, just like our psyche is, our conscious mind is living, so to the unconscious. So the ocean is kind of this perfect metaphor because when you look at the ocean, you generally don't see anything but the surface. Occasionally a fish will jump out, but normally you don't see the tremendous amount of life that's underneath the surface until you put on a diving suit and then you go down and then suddenly you're in this whole other world. So water could mean many, many different things. It could mean the ocean, the unconscious. It could symbolize tears and emotions, thus connected to feelings. So it, you can see how a symbol can point to a mystery that may ultimately be un, unsolvable in our scientific sense, particularly, but it can be multiple layered, whereas a sign means one thing. So we've, we've moved away from symbolic thinking and thus metaphorical thinking, and we much move more and more toward literal thinking, which works wonderfully well with some things. If you're gonna do science, that's where you wanna be. But if you're gonna be a human and you wanna live, then opening up to the symbolic dimension, the metaphorical dimension, and thus being able to see the value in things like story and myth and fairy tales and movies as how these could apply to the processes that are going on in the unconscious and one's own psyche, as opposed to just dead stories that you know some guys made up who were bored on a Friday night. It makes huge, huge difference. So I, I would argue for symbolic thinking as a way of kind of just opening up to even things like synchronicity, for example. There are a lot of people who have synchronicities and they just ignore them. They just go, oh, well, that was a coincidence, unless it's very overwhelming synchronicity. But if you start thinking symbolically, very often you'll be able to actually utilize that. The same is true with dreams. You know, so many people literalize dreams. They don't really have, I mean, they're not, they don't actually have an understanding of the symbolic nature of dreams. So if they dream of their friend, Joe, who's in, you know, in their real life, they have a friend named Joe and they dream of Joe in the dream. They think the dream is about Joe instead of thinking, well, what is Joe symbolizing in my conscious? Why is my unconscious using the symbol of Joe? So that's sort of what I mean by symbolic thinking. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. I, I, just to bring in a personal story on that, because you brought up Joe, I have a <laughs> girlfriend who, to me, she's always, you know, she's always getting way too, too intoxicated. I'm having to kind of take care of her. I'm the person who's more like, you know, two drinks max type of person. And she's like, two sheets to the wind you know very quickly so I'm trying to wrangle her all the time in real life and she's a lovely person and she's always crying she's very in touch with her emotions very quickly and I'm very much the opposite in a lot of ways and that's been a struggle for me so in my dreams I realized that she actually represents this feminine quality this chaos this you know fluidity this emotional being and all these things so when I can now see her because she comes in my dreams often so I knew it was a definite symbol I needed to be really looking at. And when I could recognize her as this feminine energy, I could see my interactions with her in the dream completely differently. Now they could guide me to whatever my dream was trying to show me. It was yeah. pretty groundbreaking to just uncover the, that one symbol. Yeah. yeah. I also, for me, when someone shows up, that's been really key for me is like, what do they represent for me? So like for a long time, I kept having dreams of Snoop Dogg and it, it started to ask myself like, well, what does he represent to me? And to me, he's very silly. He's goofy. He's playful. He's like, you know, just such a goof. And so it was like my psyche asking me to embrace those parts of myself, the part that's playful, that will be goofy. And there was a time that like, I had a dream that Mercedes was like kissing my neck and like whispering sweet things in my ear. And she's like a sister to me. So it was like so weird. But then I realized, you know, Mercedes to me represents logic and groundedness and centeredness. So it was like, that was my psyche trying to, those parts of me trying to entice me to, you know, have that 
exchange with them. Lately, I've been having dreams with random celebrities and I'm trying to figure out what they represent. But my guess would be that they, their symbolism would be like the unknown or, you know, the fantasy, you know, maybe I'm still digging in on that, but symbolism has been really useful. I also want to get into how important it is for men to find their art form. I'm not sure So we already on the other two questions were a little bit misconstrued on what it meant. I'm not exactly sure if art form means, you know, picking up the guitar, if it could be a martial art or what exactly that means, but I'll let you describe before I assume. Okay. Well, again, usually what I say is for men to do artwork, I'm referring to particularly things like art journaling or trying to to put, trying to connect with emotions inside and express them in some art, art, art form. Now, it is true that there are men that are going to resonate. There are some men who are terrified by looking at a white blank piece of paper. And often with those men, I'll have them try to do something that's more tactile, like clay work or mass making or even painting objects like rocks, where the form is already there and you're just trying to express it. So it's it's the idea that through artwork, we are often able to express emotions in a way that we cannot in just English language. Language sort of tends to remove us one step from the art. And sometimes, particularly for men, you know, we're, we start off behind the eight ball in terms of this emotional stuff. Women are just, they're, they're just gifted in talking about emotions. There's some people who would speculate that goes all the way back to the hunter-gatherer situation where the men are out hunting and you don't talk because it scares all the game away, whereas the women are back at the cave, so to speak, raising the children and having conversations with each other. But I, I, it's deeper than that. I'm being a little slightly trying to make a joke with that. But the idea is that women are typically much, much better at expressing emotions and much more differentiated in their emotions. So you ask a woman how she's feeling, she might come up with one of 200 different emotions. And with some men, it's like you have trouble pulling out whether they're one of the four emotions, you know, anger, sad, happy, glad. But that's partially also because the failure of the, particularly the puberty initiation, does not allow men to waken to their masculine emotional body. If you get around men who have been initiated, their emotional body is quite awakened. They are quite capable of discussing emotions and they are quite capable of expressing emotions Mm. and differentiating emotions. So it's partly this failure on the part of our culture to really initiate males into the masculine, awakened masculine body. But for many, for many men and women, if you'll do artwork in addition to your inner work, it just accelerates everything so Mm -hmm. much. So I'm continually trying to push for that. It also helps connect you to the very fundamental part of our psyche, which has to do with creativity. And in some ways, when we're creative, we're the most godlike in one way. We're bringing up our lover. Well, I'm never suggesting that we try to be gods. We make terrible gods. Thus, you don't want to ever try to become an archetype, for example. But on the other hand, creativity is just a gift that we have that no other animal has. We have an opposable thumb, Thus, we're tool makers. We're also myth makers. We're storytellers. You drop us down anywhere on this planet and we'll start telling stories. I I love my dogs, for example. My dogs have great capacity in the emotional dimension, but they have no creativity. Mm. They don't sit around discussing, should they knock out this wall (laughs) and make a bigger dog house? So (laughs) it is one of the things that is, is so distinguishing about us humans. And so I believe every human is supposed to be creative. And if you add creativity and artwork to your in, inner practice, it will accelerate it enormously. Yeah. You said a man who's been initiated, and maybe you can give us an example of, of how a man can be initiated since we have lost the you know sacred rituals for that. Okay. Well, I almost need to go back and, and talk about a time before we had lost those to kind mm-hmm. of example what this was like. You mentioned earlier, Mercedes, about women's initiations. I'm very convinced that many of the early man, pre-modern man, their attempts at initiating the male was, first of all, based upon what nature did to women. It, it doesn't take a caveman to make this, you know, you don't have to be very bright to figure out that women's menstruation cycle, which is their onset of womanhood, it's the demonstrable nature act that they can now have children. That's cosmic in its nature because it's related to the cycle of the moon. They match exactly. So again, you wouldn't have to be brilliant to figure that out. And I also suspect that the moon is quite mysterious. It's like no other light in the sky. It it grows, it grows bigger, it gets full, and then it starts dying. And this happens 
So it's a perfect metaphor for birth and death. Mm -hmm. And also, if you lived on the ocean, you would know very quickly that it affects the tides. And we also have this apocryphal idea that in full moons, people are more emotional. So again, this is pretty ancient stuff. So there's no equivalent to cosmic initiation for males. I mean, a male getting pubic hair and the ability to ejaculate and sexual orgasm is not exactly cosmic. But you, you, if you study these ancient cultures, what you find is that very often the practices that they developed and the rituals that they developed mimicked what nature did to women. So you'll often have boys taken into caves, for example, left for three days. The caves in France, I truly believe the ones that have been discovered in this last century that are dated 35, 40,000 years ago with these magnificent animal paintings on them are truly stunning. Mm. But you can imagine boys being taken in there left for three days with no light, no water, no food. You will go into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Mm. It's just inevitable. And then suddenly you can imagine the shaman initiators lighting torches and suddenly illuminating the interior of that place. Mm -hmm. It would be like a second birth. Mm -hmm. It would be like you. And, the, and in that situation, there's a very strong possibility that you would have brought up material that was uncompleted from your actual birth. The circumcision that you mentioned earlier was never done at birth. It was always done at puberty so that mm -hmm. males had an equal genital wound. So much of what's happening is that they're copying nature, so to speak, but the realization that in the case of men, a much bigger intervention needed to take place. And if you did not go through that second birth, you really weren't quite human and things would turn very demonic and toxic. This is coinciding, of course, when the young male is suddenly being flooded with a DNA testosterone agenda of aggression. And the idea was that if you did not steward that, that it would turn very, very bad, very quickly. Mm. So the idea was that you were both put through a near-death experience, a confrontation with death. You had some kind of symbolic thing, such as scarification, a very frequent thing you'll see in, in ancient culture. So when you met somebody in the woods, you'd know whether they'd been initiated or not. They literally would have stripes on their arms, the leftover vestiges of that are the military uniforms we have today, which have stripes on the arms. That's actually where that comes from. But you would have been put through this initiatory process. And again, by our modern sensibilities, this is just incredibly primitive and horrific because usually some of the boys actually died in the process. And of course, to, again, to our modern sensibilities, this is just unbelievable. But their sense was unless they were playing with death, it wasn't going to be strong enough to pull that boy out of the world of mother mm. because the world of mother is contains this euphoric memory going all the way back to in utero where all of your needs are met. Your oxygen is being supplied. Your food products are being supplied. Your waste products are being eliminated. You are directly connected to the great mother goddess. You and she are one. You're floating in this warm oceanic fluid protected from loud noises and extreme temperature changes. And literally happiness is kind of forced upon you. I don't know what your idea of bliss is, but that's mine. <laughs> powerful, powerful euphoric. So these cultures understood that if you left a boy in that world of the mother, he would never mature and be able to face things like pain, predators, to act in a warrior function to protect the tribe. So that is like a giant electromagnet, if you will, that takes a huge counterforce to pull a boy out of that. And in these cultures, if a boy survived it and he went on to go through the other stewardship around the warrior energy, from that day forward, nobody ever treated him as a boy. Mm -hmm. It was a clear cut. Before you went into the initiation, you were a boy. When you came out of it, you were a man. And in many of these cultures, their emphasis is not like our modern culture on rights. Their emphasis is on what are your obligations? What are your obligations as a man toward the, the tribe or the culture? So you would also, this is the time when you would have been introduced to the mythic stories, the religious sacred text, which all generally were stories about what happened at the beginning. You know, like the creation myths. Uh, unlike me, I started getting this when I was probably a year old in nursery school at the Southern Baptist Church. They start indoctrinating you right away. Whereas in these traditional cultures, you would have never been told mm -hmm. something as sacred as that story until you had been through the second mm -hmm. birth. So mm -hmm. there are a number of different things that coalesce together, including, and most importantly, perhaps the stewardship of older unrelated males to guide this initiatory process. You would have been taken through the warrior initiation, which would have connected you in a very powerful and regulated way to the archetype of the warrior. Then you would have been allowed to marry. 
but you would have never allowed anybody to marry who had not gone through that initiation because the odds of them turning violent were pretty great. Mm -hmm. So now what we have in the modern world is we quit doing all that basically with the knighthood traditions. And even those, of course, were mostly aristocratic. But we decided we don't need to do all that. It's all mumbo jumbo. It's all primitive stuff from the past. And it's just not a necessary thing. And consequently, we think, well, you know, boys are all warrior. Well, actually, they're not. They're boy warrior. And they're flooded with this energy, but they don't know what to do with it. And they don't know how to steward it. So unfortunately, much of that gets channeled into the shadowy parts of our culture. Things like gangs, for example. Very frequently, the young boys join those gangs right at puberty. That's the time they know something's supposed to be happening. The gangs put them through an initiation. They know a lot more about initiation than our culture does. Unfortunately, it's an initiation into a cult of death, not one that's a cult of life that could protect the culture and is concerned about the boy's soul. But the shadowy parts of our culture, you know, the Hells Angels, the Mafia, these folks, elaborate initiatory processes, yeah. often involving death. But they are not, they're the opposite, again, kind of a cult of death. So, so we see also in, in college culture, right, in fraternities and such, some sort of that happening. Do you think there are any kind of initiation processes that we have in place now in our culture that do do some positive for, for a man? There are some places in our culture where men are awaking to this. I would not put college hazing in, in mm, this. Yeah. I, I don't, that's kind of the plastic replicas of the bones of dinosaurs of ritual you know it's it's very far removed from the real thing it's usually just kind of sadomasochistic acting out yeah. basically and it can be very dangerous you know there are people killed every year doing this kind of stuff but the the real true initiation of attempting to help a boy or a girl come into their mature feminine and mature masculine with great consciousness and connecting them to a transpersonal sense, even a transpersonal center, is one of the fundamental things that's missing here. So then what happens is people either keep questing for that, but there's almost no place that really knows too much about all this. Or if they're fortunate, they'll run across somebody who has studied this, does know about this, can act as a mentor in, in this case. There are some groups of men who are around the world, actually, who are attempting to awaken this. But initiation is one of those things that sort of goes in and out of cultural awareness. And even among psychotherapists, there are not very many who know about this process, at least that I've met. But it's one of the most critical pieces that I think we badly need to wake up to. So mm -hmm. the more people we can get talking about this, thinking about this, the, that's the bad news. The good news is that in some sense, life will initiate you. And it's also possible to voluntarily go into these. Now, you don't have to go into the near death thing, but you can voluntarily seek out a guide, seek out someone, a mentor who can help you through these processes. Mm -hmm. We all go through these throughout life. They're not just at puberty. Originally, the anthropologists thought that that was the only initiation there were, but I, there, there are definitely initiations that are life cycle generated. There's one about three and a half years of age, another one about six, another one at puberty, another one around 21, another one around age 30, another one around 40, 42, and that just keeps going. You know, I, I'm at an age where I'm approaching some of the, the latter ones, but I do believe it's possible for you to keep, to be open to the fact that we're all supposed to be going through these major processes of change. Managing change is one of those difficult things that humans have to face. And simply, you know, there are some many things we know about initiation. One is that there is a structure to the container of initiation. And if that structure is not missing or is defective, then the initiations are usually aborted or failed. Mm -hmm. and we have a lot of this today, unfortunately, where people are kind of self-appointed gurus who are offering what appears to be sacred space, but they actually don't know anything about it and they're not contained. And so they're, in a way, they're sort of like a Harry Potter who sneaks into his master's room and grabs a wand and conjures up a spirit and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But there are some components of sacred space that either make the initiatory space liminal, which means healing, or liminoid, which means it looks like it should be healing, but it's actually not, or even worse, it's destructive. So 
this is not anything new. This has been going on forever. It has to do with the difficulties of the magician archetype. But there, there is increasing awareness of this. And, and I think many, many men, particularly in, and women as well, of course, hunger for this kind of knowledge. And so yeah. I've just been very, very blessed to be able to work in this area for the last three decades. And I think it's one of the most important things we can do for our own personal psychological and spiritual growth. We yeah. agree wholeheartedly. And I believe your mentor... One of your mentors, at least, was Robert Moore, who wrote the book, King Warrior Magician Lover. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's so amazing. The right. workshop that we did last night with our men's group was on those four archetypes. So I'm really cool to be able to have you on today following that. Yeah. And James, I do want to dive into to shadow work with you because that's a really big one. And I want to make sure we are respecting your time here. So what does it look like for a man to enter shadow work? Okay. Well, we can use shadow in two broad senses. One would be anything in the unconscious, meaning anything we're not aware of. For some people, even the idea of the unconscious is rather abstract, but I can pretty easily demonstrate that you have one. First of all, if you've ever driven down the freeway and you've been intensely thinking about some issue that's going on in your life, and suddenly you realize you haven't been driving for the last 15 minutes, somebody's been driving, and typically it's your unconscious. You also will be able to demonstrate the unconscious very easily when you suddenly have outbursts of affect and emotion that are way over the top for what the situation calls for. And then the other place, of course, is in dream work. Every night, your conscious mind goes to sleep. That's the definition of that state. And the unconscious now has a stage, and it creates these incredible movies. So it's pretty easy to demonstrate it, but becoming aware of it and trying to begin to investigate how it affects us in our daily life is the great shift from my point of view. So the shadow work is almost one of the most important things that I can think of in addition to this initiatory material, because the, sh the concept of shadow is that we carry within us rejected parts. Uh, almost every position we take, we automatically create its opposite. And then, but the fact is, it's like we push them all down into the basement. And we don't want to know about them because they may be incompatible with our own self-image. They may be, typically the first shadow begins to get created by the family of origin, where qualities that we have that might actually not be bad qualities, they might be very good qualities, are somehow shamed or rejected by the family. And then that gets extended to the culture. And of course, when we all go off to school, you learn very quickly what's cool and what's not cool. And the parts of you that aren't cool, you try to get rid of. So we wind up, Robert Bly used to use this wonderful metaphor. We put all this stuff in the bag that we drag behind us. And so the bigger our light, the bigger our shadow is. And if we are not at some point, and again, it's usually midlife, people start turning around and trying to pull stuff back out of the bag again. And some of it is things that we just simply need to acknowledge that we have so that we don't act them out unconsciously. So if I have a particular quality, let's say I, I decide early in life based upon my family of origin, based upon my own personality, that I'm going to be a nice guy. And I go out of my way to be just the nicest, most pleasant guy. I never say any bad words to anybody. Well, where's my aggression? It's turning into a really big, huge counterbalance inside my psyche and then suddenly one day it'll come roaring out and I've put my fist through the door or I've thrown the teacup across the room and shattered it or I'm yelling at my kids or I'm kicking the cat and then that recedes and I go oh my god I, I can't let that out again look what that damage happened and then I'll start doing passive aggressive behaviors and then I'll avoid conflict and it, then I'll have my personality be quite inauthentic because I'm not connecting to anger it would be far better if I learned how to do clean anger. If I'm given that modeling, even taught that as a class, it would be wonderful. But certainly if our family of origin said, look, anger is a, is a natural emotion. Life is, things are in life are going to make you angry. But it's far better for you to directly convey that you're anger, to own the anger. And also in clean anger, you're, you have the possibility of offering a solution. So instead of doing it passively, aggressively, or pretending I don't have it, I try to become more authentic and whole by saying, you know, to a person who's made me angry, look, when you did this, it made me angry. And here's what I need you to do to make restitution. Bake me a batch of chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. We'll be fine. But that usually what happens is we get either repression or we get the extreme of it, which is rage. And rage by that point is not seeking any resolution. It's just seeking to hurt and damage. Mm -hmm. So when we get in touch with shadow work, we're beginning to become, if we can own that shadow, then we become more whole, less perfect. 
And our whole culture, even our main religion, is based upon an idea of perfection, which none of us can ever reach. And therefore, we, a lot of us develop a lot of shame and a lot of inner adversarial voice that continues to hit us with how we're not you know, measuring up to the idea of perfection. So shadow work is very, very difficult. It's hard. It's owning things you think are not you at all. But the alternative is if you do not do shadow work, the shadow will project itself out onto whoever has a hook that will hold it. And so at the risk of misunderstanding, I'll use a political metaphor. Let's say I decide I'm going to be a really good card carrying Republican. I mean, I'm dyed in the wool Republican. Well, all I've done is create a counterbalance on the other side, like a schoolyard teeter totter. You know, I have this, the bigger Republican I become, the bigger the Democrat is, except I don't know that. And I just go along life thinking I'm only a Republican. And then along comes a Democrat with a Democrat hook. And my shadow Democrat jumps out on them and I hate them and want to kill them. This is what James Joyce refers to as the nightmare of history. Is this is the whole of human history. I have the right religion. Yours, I need to kill you because you have a different one than I do. Or your skin color is different than mine. You're bad. So when we do shadow work, we don't become the shadow, but we own that we have it. And thus, we don't need to project it any longer. So then the charge comes off of all these other people that we were so judgmental and maybe hateful toward. So it's, if I had one wish, it would be that everybody in the world do shadow work. So this it would reduce the amount of pain in the world enormously. So it's a huge, huge subject. We could spend several hours talking about shadow work, but I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of at least when. Yeah, absolutely. You have a great, maybe in a great place for men to start doing that work? Well, many of my, my workshops are geared toward this, but all of my individual work is geared toward this. I do both work on the archetypal level. I do a lot of work on the archetypal level, but it also a lot of work on shadow, of just trying to help men seriously examine the background of their own personal unconscious, as well as things like the transpersonal unconscious, which includes the archetypes. Yeah, that's, we're going to give you that information in just a second here, guys, if you're, if you're watching or listening to this now. So get pen and paper out for that. Yeah. So there are a few short questions, James, that we like to ask everyone who comes on the show. So we'll kind of wrap up with those and then we'll okay. hop into the Q&A session okay. from the, the guests today. All right. So the first question is, if you could hug your younger self right now, what would you say? I would say always run toward the fear. How old were you? I would love for somebody to tell me that when I was three and a half. If you could have the whole world read one book, which would it be? I'm sorry. You if you out. could have the whole world read one book, which would it be? That was, that's an almost impossible question. <laughs> no, everyone feels that way. Okay. Off the top of my head, it would be Man and His Symbols. Okay. It was co-written by Carl Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz and Joseph Henderson. It is a book later in Jung's life, and it was specifically written as a kind of an introduction to his work. But if you do buy it, make sure you buy the large hardcover edition because the soft cover edition, the paperback is terrible. It's hard to read and it doesn't have the images. Huh. But that's a great introduction to Young's work. And I guess that would be my secret hope is to introduce people to Young. Yeah, I'm about halfway through it. All right. If you could whisper one phrase to everyone on the planet, what would it be? You are important. Before we jump into the Q&A, what ways can people work with you and how can they get in contact with you for that? Okay. The easiest way is to go to my website, which is jamesfraser.com. jamesfraser.com. There's a email box that you can send me an email and then we can go from there. Perfect. Yeah. Guys, I hope you do reach out to James because I think this is a great place for you to start doing this work. I know that if you're here from our men's workshop, you are already entering a lot of this deep diving. So he is a great extension of that. If you are looking to go further, definitely hit him up. All right, James. So we're going to jump into the Q&A session. And I have a question here it says, James, I think you said you should not attempt to become an archetype. What did you mean by that? Oh, boy, that. That's also a very big subject. I'm responding to the fact that occasionally I'll see people posting things in places like Facebook and other things like saying, what archetype are you? It's sort of giving the idea that one, your small S self ego could even control something like an archetype or mm -hmm. worse that you might want to identify with an archetype. Archetypes are beyond human level energies. They are energies that, are, that absolutely fuel our psyche, but they're grandiose, they're gigantic, and possession by an archetype always turns demonic. So when you, the, the whole, all of this work, ultimately, I think for many of us comes down to 
particularly with these four major archetypes that Robert Moore did so much work around and had the great good fortune of learning from. It's actually the, the little less human self that has to regulate these things. So regulating archetypal energy so that you can use it appropriately and not be flooded with it or possessed by it is actually the key. So much like a campfire, for example, if you build a campfire on a cold winter's night, you want to be optimal distance from the campfire to receive the warmth, but you don't want to jump into the campfire because it will consume you. You'll be burned up. You, don't, you also don't want to be so far away that you freeze to death. Mm -hmm. So the optimal distance and regulation of archetypal energy is the key. If you get inflated in an archetype, it can take over you and your personality go right out the door. And I can give you many, many examples from history where that has happened, where it almost always turns demonic. So just for example, a person flooding with lover energy is very prone to being in the active side of this, which is addiction. So if you get somebody who's flooding with lover energy, they may very well get addicted to some substance, which then completely destroys their life. Whereas we all need lover energy, but you don't want to be flooded with it or identified with it. This is true with the magician archetype. It's true with the warrior archetype. It's true with the king and queen archetype. You do not want to be an archetype. That's just, mm -hmm. that's not, you want to, any more than you want to take your toaster down directly to the nuclear power plant and, and directly hook it into the reactor because there won't be any toast, there won't be any toaster, and there won't be any you. You've mm -hmm. got to have appropriate regulation, transformers, wiring to your house, switches, fuse panel. Then you can adequately plug in your toaster and get some toast. So in a similar way, these archetypes were kind of like that, to use that technological metaphor. They're like a nuclear power plant, and it's just not a desirable thing to become an archetype. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. We have another one. It says, what is a technique for specifically healing my mother wound, and how can I stop projecting it onto my partner? <clears throat> Well, that's a really good one. The first thing is you've got some awareness that you have it and that you are projecting. And so the hard work is then beginning to pull back the projection of really realizing this is an internal thing that needs to be handled internally. So that's no mean feat, by the way. But if you can do that, then you can begin to actually deal with and look inside at what are all the dimensions of this. And as I said, when we started, it's probably bigger than just your actual mother but you can do things like journaling. It's a wonderful way to what I call circumambulation around something. You just keep journaling and writing as much as you can about your mother, about the experience of the mother. And then again, this is generally better facilitated if you're working with someone, but if you're working on your own, trying to express some of the emotions that may come up with that in artwork can be quite helpful. And like all complexes, which again, generally the mother wound is kind of synonymous with negative mother complex, like all complexes, you're wanting to try to get to a place where you know as much as you can about the archetype, excuse me, about the complex, and then you're wanting to try to build boundaries between you and that. So that that, arc, that, that I keep saying archetype, sorry, that that complex, when it constellates, the time that it's taken over is less and less and less, and the time it takes you to get conscious of it is shorter and shorter and shorter, and then you developing defenses against allowing that to take to take over in other words to, to get to a place where you know you have that complex and even if it constellates you refuse to act it out so getting conscious about the projection process is very very important and just trying to pull back that projection and saying it's both unfair to my partner but also i don't want to keep doing that and where i need, really need to, to work on this is an internal process not out here yeah yeah so I have another one here. It says, what was one of your biggest takeaways from working with Robert Moore? A blessing. Robert Moore blessed me enormously in so many different ways. The second thing, of course, is that this model opened up a doorway for me that I cannot even now reflect back and imagine what my life would have been like without it. His, his work is much more than just masculine psychology. He became famous as being a masculine psychologist. He actually published this book because of an incident he had when he was traveling in India where they cab driver turned down one street and said to him, there are 7,000 prostitutes on this street, men, women, and children. You can buy any of them, do anything you want to with them. And it hit him like a cast iron frying pan. And when he got back to the University of Chicago and sitting in the committee meetings, doing all the drivel that goes on in committee meetings and realizing the tremendous psychopathology that's in the world from the boy masculine, 
he was decided to publish this several years earlier as a kind of a way to help me try to get some orientation about what some of the stuff was going on. So it opened up the whole world for me about my own woundedness in the masculine, about my need to connect with the masculine, about the work I needed to do on Warrior. And it's just simply the the most effective model I've ever come across in all of my studies of different schools of psychology. It sounds very abstract at first, like archetypes, you know, what are those things? But actually, it's the most practical thing I know of. You don't have to be in psychotherapy 15 years to figure out what's wrong with you. You can take somebody who has never read a book on psychology, and within a couple of three sessions, they begin to grasp this model. And within six sessions, they're like, okay, self-identifying what they need to do. So it's well, just by learning which archetype they need to, which archetypes energy they need to work with and which one may be inflated. Yes. I might be flooding in and then putting energy into the opposite. Generally we'll have two of these more or less in our conscious and two more or less unconscious. So the balancing act is usually working on the opposite energy. So if you're flooded with magician and you have too much magician, you're too That's detached and manipulating or the passive side of it, denying innocence, you know, either one of those, you need to put more energy into the queen or the king archetype because that helps balance that out. Same is true with the lover and the warrior. And you can see this in addictions, for example, where a person is addicted to say something like alcohol and they become chronic alcoholic. And they cannot set a boundary between them and the alcohol. They can't do like Mercedes was saying earlier, I could take two drinks and then I stop. They just keep going. Two drinks is better, four is great, six is wonderful, then they pass out or they get into these really addictive processes. So the most effective program, and of course it's nowhere near the percentage that would, one would hope, but the most effective program is Alcoholics Anonymous. And Alcoholics Anonymous, even though they don't talk about it like this, it's a warrior program. It's mm -hmm. They do the same ritual every time. It's other people. It's asking for help. That's a real warrior move. Contrary to our Americanized, skewed warrior image, like, you know, Rambo, who's got one pocket knife, has been shot 47 times, but he's single-handedly facing off 17,000 of the enemy. That's complete, total Hollywood. That's not the real deal. The real deal is that you need to ask for help to go beyond your limits. So AA is actually a warriorship program. So you see people learning how to do boundaries, how to not drink, how to start living. And at first, it's really, really simple, but it's that act of asking for help that is so powerful and helps a person start moving toward a balancing so that they no longer have to do the addictive processes. So you can see in all of these, these are dynamically opposed to each other and thus putting energy in one side helps balance out the other side. Yeah, that's so beautifully put too, that it's about asking for help because, you know, and, and I guess we would also call it creating accountability, you know, and especially when you talk about that AA program, it really resonates. We're actually having on a guest we've had before, but specifically for our men's group, we're having on Michael Brody Waite, who is a addict turn three-time CEO. And he now has all these leadership programs. He works with men and women to really help them embody that, that King energy essentially. And it's so much of it is about removing the mask. And that comes with having someone and something to be accountable to. So yeah, it's beautifully put. I wish we had done the whole call with you just on the archetypes. <laughs> we have just two more questions from our group and then we'll, we'll wrap up with you. Okay. So why do some therapists seem to point men to look specifically at mother wounds and then some focusing on father wounds is the, is the important direction to look. So why do some, you know, therapists point towards father and others towards mother? I obviously can't really answer that without knowing specifically therapists. My knee jerk re reaction is their own un owned material or maybe their owned material. Yeah. I, I, really argue for the fact that we're, we're all going to get wounded in childhood. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is whether we got consciously wounded or unconsciously wounded. And then the responsibility, however, is ours. It's not the parents. So some therapists just seem, and some schools of therapy tend to be orientated towards certain ways. And so it could be the educate the person's education or their own experience. I'm, I'm not, I'm an equal opportunity person. I, I, I think both parents have some negative effects as well as positive effects. Mm -hmm. What I'm more interested in is what is the developmental process of the childhood that the person went through? How did that, how did the developmental things either get done or are missing? Mm -hmm. And so even with symptoms, I don't work like a therapist does, which therapists, particularly psychiatrists are looking at a symptom for a diagnosis, which is not only how they get paid, but also determines in the case of psychiatry these days, which drug they're going to give you. 
Whereas for me, symptoms are simply signposts pointing toward developmental process. For example, if you go to a psychiatrist with the, the most frequent disorder that people show up for, which is anxiety, the first thing they're going to do is pull out a prescription pad and write your prescription for something like Xanax. And that's probably as far as it'll go, because there's not much emphasis on trying to figure out why you're anxious. Whereas for me, anxiety almost always indicates you're inadequately connected to warrior energy, because if you're mm -hmm. truly connected to warrior energy, you'll be calm. You won't be full of anxiety and your life will be less chaotic. If you're organized mostly in love or magician, your life's going to be chaotic and you're going to have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a balance with the sovereign energy and the warrior and you don't have to give up magician and lover, by the way, but your life will become much more organized. It'll be more centered. It'll be less chaotic and thus you'll have less anxiety. Now, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement that there's no such thing as biochemically induced mm -hmm. anxiety, but I, I really haven't seen much of it. Mostly what I see is people who need more adequate connection to warrior. Mm -hmm. And of course, in our culture, we don't really believe women should be connected to warrior. Just to me, crazy. I think we should be teaching young women martial arts when they're in kindergarten. There's no reason that a woman should be as vulnerable as many women feel. And we don't have to demonize that warrior energy in a woman. We can mm -hmm. foster it. We can steward it. We can, And a woman doesn't have to give up her femininity to be connected to warrior in a positive way. Mm -hmm. But that's our image. Usually women who are really connected with warrior, we think of them as not particularly feminine. And some of them, of course, are not because they're animus dominated. They've allowed their their inner masculine to get in the wrong place. But that's kind of our image. So we're, we're very black and white in our thinking, Yeah. which I, I think all, all people should be initiated into warrior energy. Yeah, that really resonates with me personally because of that anxiety and panic. All that came out of me. And it certainly was, a, a lot of it was because I wasn't setting proper boundaries for myself. I was over over overdoing it in all aspects of my life, really overworking myself, saying yes when I should be saying no. I just didn't have any kind of boundaries set in place. And that's is maybe a less obvious way that we need to be able to protect ourselves than doing a martial art course. But women, I find so many women, especially in my sphere, are overachievers or they are putting themselves putting others in front of themselves or putting them their work in front of their own, you know, physical needs or whatever else they might need in their life and just don't have the boundaries or even the, the knowing that they need to be setting boundaries, you know, doesn't even come into play. So that makes a lot of sense that the warrior is what needs to be looked at there. Yeah. And I am curious if, if I feel that my magician is inflated and I feel that my lover is suppressed, would I try to channel the queen energy most? Well, I think, I mean, ultimately we have to work on all four of these. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the fastest way to bring balance to one that's imbalanced is putting energy into the other one, the opposite. Mm -hmm. So if I've got way too much magician, I may drift off into so much deconstructionism that I become cynical about everything and everybody. Comics, for example, make us all laugh because they're in the magician. They're deconstructing. Mm -hmm. They're showing us how silly we are there, which is true. But they also can become quite cynical because they're not standing for anything. There's nothing positive. It's just humans are stupid and that's the end of the story. Whereas if you actually balance that magician out with some of the sovereign energy, you can start to bless us and move toward being a centering force that can bring cosmos out of chaos. Then that makes that magician less cynical, less deconstruct, less overrunning with deconstruction energy. So one of the examples you can see this is in our, in our university settings, postmodernism is really what's taken over the last half of the 20th century, where you, you'll you learn very quickly, particularly if you're in the humanities, at least I did anyway. I, I went to university thinking I was supposed to do something, but you very quickly learn that's not, they don't want that. They want you to show how other people who tried to do something are so stupid. Then you get real good accolades. I'm being a little unfair here, but I'm just for the purposes of pointing this out. I've always wanted to go to a postmodernist convention and stand up in the middle of it rather mischievously, I guess, but I'd like to stand up and say, exactly what are you folks for? What are you taking a stand for? Mm -hmm. Telling me everything that's wrong, but the, and that's some of that's useful, but so you can get too much magician. So moving into that king to try to figure out how you can think about the whole realm, how you can bring order out of chaos will help balance that magician. If you have a repressed lover, very frequently, oddly, maybe moving toward autonomy is part of the part of the situation, which would be the warrior energy to give you the safety to be able to fully express your love without feeling like you're going to get harmed or hurt or 
slipping into codependent behaviors and, you know, all the other difficulties that come with, from with that. So conversely, if, if you've got somebody who's just shooting up with warrior energy, they badly need to put some effort and energy into the lover. So this often happens with men who kind of get into a workaholism kind of thing where, you know, they spend they work 70 hours a week and they don't have any time for their children. They don't have any time for their wife. They don't know that their, their magician's not working. So when they come home, they're still working. Mm -hmm. when they're supposed to be getting into the garden with their lover. So those folks can help balance that warrior out by doing the lover. But ultimately, we need all four of these online. We need all of them regulated and balanced. And if you do that, your relationships will get better. Your insights will become better. Your boundary setting capability will become better. And you will be much better at creating a sense of cosmos, both within your psyche, as well as within your sphere of influence. Yeah. Ooh. Again, I wish we did a whole thing <laughs> just on the archetypes, but maybe had another time. So our last question seems the collective considers midlife issues as a negative issue for men. Do you find men going through this tend to push it deep into the bag they're dragging and just ignore the questions within self? Well, we certainly have a lot of acting out. You know, we call it the midlife crisis because this is mostly what we see. We don't have much awareness that this is a tremendous time of initiation, a tremendous opportunity for change and growth, and even a movement turning toward a more balanced life, particularly in the area of spirituality and psychological growth so we you know the classic thing is that you maybe you you came up and your father was an accountant so he said that's what you should be and you said okay i'll become an accountant but in fact you had the soul of an artist but you did it you got your cpa you did all the stuff but you did this, everything society called for you got married you had the 2.7 children you got the golf club membership the boat in the backyard and then at 42 everything goes flat 40 42 and so you suddenly think, well, my, my life is just nothing is, is bringing me happiness. But you know, that 18 year old secretary that they just hired, wow, man, she lights up my life. And suddenly you're in an affair with an 18 year old secretary and you decide to move off to New Zealand to become a goat farmer. Not exactly the best way to handle this kind of thing. But without guides, without any cultural understanding, men are just kind of, and women too, are left with this. It's not just men. So we see a lot of acting out. We see, you know, the incidence of people buying red Corvettes goes up through the ceiling around this age period. Plastic surgery becomes all vogue, where it's really what's supposed to be happening is us pulling stuff out of the bag, not putting more into it. So if I understand the question correctly, I, yeah, I do think a lot of people try to do what's called regressive restoration of the persona. It's like on a, you know, a computer. If mm. a computer goes haywire, there's a restore button, or at least on some computers, where you hit the restore button and it takes you back to the time period before everything went chaotic. And a lot of people try to do that. So that's actually a rejection of the call to initiation. It's an attempt to go back to how it was, clean it all up, get it all put back together. So there is a significant amount of putting stuff into the bag at midlife, unfortunately, primarily because people just don't know what to do. What comes from that is that, I mean, we talk about dis-ease being an, an alignment inside the body or body-mind, at least. What happens when we continue to stuff down the stuff we are needing to look at? Well, because some people are successful at this. You know, they, they live the conventional life and they go through the midlife crisis with just more or less a blip and think they had bad cases of indigestion or something. And then they just stay very rigidly controlled in their conventional way of living. For other people, it sets up a real neurosis where there's a real war with oneself because the higher self, our, our transpersonal self, is seeking manifestation. It's seeking for us to get bigger. And so it keeps ripping this fabric of our universe to give us the opportunity to get bigger. And we keep interpreting that as disaster. And so we do everything we can to get that put back together instead of embracing it and saying, okay, I have to figure out a new kind of way of living. I have to figure out a new life. And again, if you have some guides, if you have some people who know about this, they can help you greatly by saying, no, you know, this is, yeah, I know you've had this big loss and I know you're facing great difficulties, but if you work through it and you face the challenges, you'll come out on the other side with a changed sense of self. And then your life can open up. I mean, it, it, it's, I'm always hesitant to start telling people all the great things that can happen when you do this, because I don't want to sound like I'm selling something. 
but truly, if I look back on my own life, before I started doing this deep level work, and especially the archetypal work, it's like I'm talking about somebody else. There's no comparison. I can't imagine what my life would have been like. And I can say that my life is deep and rich and full of meaning. And I'm, I've developed the capacity for awe and wonder. And so it's just a very, very different situation than the world and the life and who, who I was before I did all this work. Yeah, it makes me think of something we talk about on the podcast a lot, which is thinking from your deathbed head and just putting yourself in that mindset of where you're laying on your deathbed do you have regrets because you don't feel you lived a full spectrum life? You know, do you feel like you didn't get all the juiciness that was offered here because you obstructed yourself in some way? So yeah. that is beautiful to hear that, that your journey is working out well. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today. I know I said I was, you know, working on this inflated magician, but I think even though this may be that that's at wanting me to do this, I'm going to book a session or two with you <laughs> just, to, just to try to, cause those few moments of talking about the archetypes was so helpful. So I'd love to dig deeper into that with you and, and really figure out what exercises I can do and things like that. So sounds so magician, like, so it's kind of a catch 22, but we have actually a, a really beautiful comment from one of our attendees that says this is so eye-opening even for a guy seeing a counselor for a few years he's been doing that now so thank you for your oh. information yeah and I think what's different with James is his style is more mentorship if I'm correct right yes yeah so yeah. a mentor really like he said with Robert Moore is like it's blessing they they speak into you yeah and hold that space that beautiful yeah. Thank you, James, for coming on the show. And thank, thank you for you the work you're putting into this world, not just here today, but just generally we've, I've, you know, through Jade and through Tom known so much beauty is coming through that channel on its own. And it's even flowing as deeply as to me just through that channel alone. So we really appreciate you here and being such a light. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have I a really good rest of your day. It. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.